Welcome to Jill Asset News, take your top stories in cryptocurrency and digital assets and break them down into bite-sized pieces. Today we've got some great stuff. First up, crypto long and short, there's going to be four metrics that show how this Bitcoin rally is different from 2017. We're going to take a look at some great data points, but I can tell you right now, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Also, massive run-up price in Ethereum, and the reason could be that the Ethereum 2.0 deposits have hit 60% as the launch date looms, which is December 1st. However, it looks like there's still going to be a delay. What this is going to mean for the Ethereum price today and moving on into the future. So we'll go over both those points, but first take a look at what's going on in the market. So today, it is the 23rd of November. Looks like we're almost at Thanksgiving for all of the uh, U.S. residents, and this is my favorite holiday because I get to eat like a pig and I don't really care, so it should be a good time. But before we get into that stuff, let's take a look at the price action. So today, Bitcoin up again, 0.6%. I mean, not really up. I mean, we actually had been around 18.6, 18.7 over the last uh, you know two or three days, so it is up a little bit, but it's a little bit deceiving. However, it's almost up 15% for a seven-day average, and things are looking pretty darn good. So great job for all you Bitcoin and Ethereum holders because Ethereum went up on a tear today. So it's almost 12%, 32% for seven days, and almost about to breach 600. And uh, me and a couple of my friends have been texting back and forth, and we had talked about, wow, Bitcoin or Ethereum might actually go above 500. Wow, I'm almost get might hit 550. I woke up today, I'm like, wow, we're almost at 600. So I mean, how high could this go? Well, we're going to talk about that in the second article. XRP, nah, XRP. Tether is Tether, and uh, it's got a market cap of 18 billion. And then XRP, I, I, I'm sorry, I hate. I sometimes I like doing this because I know the XRP army always listens to my videos. They're like, why do you skip over XRP and XRP? XRP? Look, uh, XRP is on a magnificent tear. I mean, I'm not going to take anything away from it. I'm actually very happy. I mean, everybody uh, that has invested in XRP, this is a great day for you guys and gals because, you know, you take a lot of flack. So congratulations. This is a pretty good day. I personally uh, will not sell until I hit my my points and it is, it is way far away. And the reason why I don't is because I'm super stubborn and I don't really care. <laughs> that's, that's what it comes down to. So XRP, congratulations, 22% uh, for 24 hours and 100%, look at that, 100% for a week and they breached the 50 cent mark. So congratulations, all you XRP holders, including myself. Chainlink, uh, 22% for the week, 3.9, $14, almost 15. We're gonna get up to, I think, our all-time high of around 18, 18.50 for Chainlink, and it's gonna be a great day. I think it's gonna go up to, in 2021, if I had to make a guess, I'd put it over 50. Uh, that's not financial advice, I just kinda see where it's going. I mean, look, uh, there's other different oracles out there, but Chainlink is uh, one of the first. It's got a lot of different uh, people that they know. Again, it's not, uh, uh, what you know, it's who you know, and Chainlink has been uh, making a lot of inroads into that. So uh, we'll see how it goes. Litecoin, massive tear. I mean, look, everything's in a massive tear. Cardano, finally above a dime. Uh, it's at 15 cents at 15%, 51% for the week. These are all seven day average, which is just outstanding. Stellar at 40%. I still have to Stellar, but it's still at 11 cents. So what are you going to do? Uh, 20%, 33%. Look, Everything's up. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on this, but uh, if you had just had some strong hands, uh, you're having a pretty great week, <laughs> let's be honest. And mm -hmm. if you haven't, well, it's just like one of those uh, things that you should remember that it's best a lot of times just to have strong hands and uh, don't listen to the naysayers and just hold usually. Not usually, but sometimes uh, thing wor things work out. That's all I'll say. So it is a great uh, great day, great week. And I think 2021, we're up for uh, massive fireworks, but I could be wrong. Let's break into today's top stories. So first up, this is a great article. Uh, this is written by, who wrote this? Gallon Moore. Who's Gallon Moore? Gallon Moore looks like a Red Sox fan. Uh, he's also a senior research analyst at Coindesk, focused on developing metrics and analysis for crypto asset investors. He holds Bitcoin and Ether. Ether. So uh, I got to follow this guy. He uh, writes a good article. So it is an opinion piece, but he lays it all out pretty slick with a lot of different data points. And you can tell a lot of work went into this. So Galen, thanks a lot. What this all is, is it really comes down to this. 
this bull run, which is happening right now and in, in next year, is a little bit different than the 2017. And I agree and I don't agree. Uh, like I said, the more things change, the more they stay the same. They are There are still fundamentals that we should all adhere to. One of those is not dumping everything going, ah, oh, it's different. It's going to go to the moon all the way up. Well, we saw that uh, on Sunday, which we did a video and I talked about it. I go, look, Bitcoin was at 18.6 when I woke up at, because I usually wake up at like 4.35, it was around 17.7 and it was a great opportunity to buy. If I would have FOMO'd into everything, I would miss that opportunity to pick up some cheap Bitcoin, also some cheap alts. So these are one of the things that we talk about. But Galen is right. This is a different one and we're going to lay it out into four points. What those four points are, are Bitcoin whales and trading versus holding, Bitcoin versus Ether, regulator versus offshore, and North America versus East Asia. What am I talking about? I'll tell you right now. So Bitcoin whales and trading versus holding, there's two different graphs here. And I'm. it's interesting, but it's not interesting uh, because you have to take this with a grain of salt, really is what is talked about here, because these are just addresses. And it looks at how this blue line is... Let me, uh, let me pull it up. This blue line here, this is all the different Bitcoin uh, addresses uh, that have more than more than uh, than one Bitcoin. And you can see right here where it just massively jumped up during that 2017 uh, crazy bull run. And it was, it was a lot of them. However, even though it went down, even though it went down here and it, it went to the ground, there still was a lot of addresses that were slowly accumulating and keeping up with that one Bitcoin until until where here we are today. Look at this massive spike, but there is no massive spike in the actual addresses because people are starting to just get it that, hey, this is digital gold. This is a great thing. This is going to be, this is going to change the world or Bitcoin is digital gold. It's scarce or really it's finite, only 21 million. And essentially it's insurance against this crazy market and this quantitative easing. Unlike gold, I can send it to anyone anywhere in the world within minutes for next to nothing. It's the best performing asset class ever. It's beaten gold, oil, stocks, everything ever. It used to be worth a nickel and now it's worth 18,500. And it's why I'm heavily invested into it. So I think people are just getting and understanding exactly what we're talking about here. And they want to be a part of that. So it's, it's interesting, but again, it's just a little piece here. And then there's another nice little whale graph here. Address is holding at least a thousand Bitcoin. See, there was a huge run up here from 12, 13, 14, and then just kind of leveled off a little bit. And then all of a sudden these a thousand Bitcoin addresses, let me blow it up. It went down when there was a huge spike because the smart money says, I'm out of here. And they just dump Bitcoin. But now looks what happens. It's We're still having the same type of thing, same thing. And then here we are. To me, I still look at this and I'm like, I'm kind of worried about a dump at some point. Because if you look at these points, you're like, okay, here and then here. And then it's still going up. And then, of course, this is going up. So what happens at 50,000? Is it going to be another dump? Only time will tell. But I can tell you right now, the people that made the most money in cryptocurrency digital assets. They didn't invest here. They didn't invest here. They're not investing here. They invested right here, right here when it was super boring and right here when it was everybody was afraid. That's where all the money's made. It's not made here and here. It's what we all did and we all put in that hard work to invest when nobody wanted to invest. Remember that. And then lastly, and this is probably the one that I think is the most important, it's traders versus investors. On this channel, I was really anti-trader uh, uh, when I first started this channel. Now I'm like, if you want to trade, go right ahead. I, I don't care. It's fun. You know, it's fun. 10 and 20%, maybe 30% of your portfolio, trade away. Have, have a great time. However, I always say try to be more of an investor than a gambler or a trader because uh, it really usually works out better for you if you can just set it and forget it. And this is one of those things where, let me blow this up. So back in the day in 2017, this orange line, this is the uh, investor portion of uh, Bitcoin. And you still would see a lot of it, right? But then there was a rise. There was a rise of trading Bitcoin. That was in 17, 18, 19. And then around right here, something happened in January 2019 where people just said, you know what? <laughs> I'm done trading this. I'm just going to hold it because that's just what I want to do. And then you see the traders, they just kind of just tailed off. And then the investors, mostly what I do, maybe what you do, is we just kept holding and holding and holding. And here we are today. I think that's more of a metric of how this has really changed over time. So, okay, so there's that those pieces. Now we're going to take a look at Bitcoin versus Ether and everything else. So what are we talking about here? Well, in 2017, all the way up to 
uh, and this is ver the very beginning to the very end, you would see like this blue mark, let me blow it up. This blue mark here is Ethereum. And there was a massive, massive spike because of the ICO craze, right? But Bitcoin just did its thing. Kind of boring. Man, don't worry about me. I'll go up. And then I just did that, right? But then of course, Ethereum was just hot, hot, massive. And then kind of uh, inversed here uh, in November 2017. And of course, we all know what happened then, right? But there was still some monstrous gains for Ethereum from here to here. Bitcoin from here to here, right? All right, fantastic. However, in 2020, we're still seeing the same type of thing right here. So again, in the light blue, this is Ethereum, and the dark uh, portion here, here is uh, Bitcoin. However, 176 and 257 is nothing to sneeze at. I mean, I'll still take either of them. The question then is, and as we come down here, is which one is gonna do better? Is it going to be Ethereum or is it gonna be Bitcoin? I don't know. But that's why I'm heavy in both, because I have no idea. And I will just say this. I forgot who said it, but they, they talked about if you just don't really understand, uh, you know, yield farming and DeFi and things like that, or these different projects, just buy Ethereum because everything's built on Ethereum and it makes sense, right? So we just do it that way and uh, everything works itself out. However, this one is different. And this is the chart. This is the graph that pretty much lays it out as well. And it talks about the Bitcoin dominance. Let me blow this up. Bitcoin dominance is this gold piece right here, this gold line. And we can see in 2017 in Q1, it was almost 90% dominant. But then all of a sudden with the ICO craze and, and the explosion of, of different market cap gems that are out there, uh, it inversed. And there was a huge amount of dominance of a large number of uh, altcoins. I'm not saying it was one altcoin. Obviously, it was uh, hundreds, uh, but th that's what happened. And then, of course, down in Q4, Q1, it kind of switched around. And here we are right now. As of today, we're looking at between maybe around 55% or 58% uh, dominance for Bitcoin. And then the altcoins are somewhere... Actually, excuse me, this is Bitcoin dominance. This isn't uh, market cap dominance. So we're looking at 55%, and this is number of assets. So back then, it wasn't that many. Now here we are around 80 plus uh, different assets, which are 95% of the market composition. Obviously, there is like thousands out there, but most of them suck and they don't really count. But here's the rub, and this was the interesting thing. Just like how we have the S&P 500, where we have a ton of uh, different stocks that uh, make up the top 500 uh, stocks of the S&P 500. There's really only five assets that are the big major players in the space. So if we're looking at a total market cap of 554 billion, I mean, 340 billion, yeah, 58%. But then the next one is the big lion share, 67 billion, which is Ethereum. Then we got 24. Tether's at 18, and then we got five, five, fives, fives, and fours, and then we kind of just go down to you know less than less than a billion. But if you add those all up, that is 95% of what's going on. But again, just like the S&P 500, the top five, which are Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Google, Netflix, and Microsoft, so six, excuse me, make up like 25%, and the numbers fluctuate, so don't quote me, of the entire S&P 500. And here we see the top five, six, seven. Those really make up the lion's share of the entire market cap. Now, we put them all together, then it makes something else. But uh, right now, this is what it is. And back then, that did not happen. In 2017, there was very few and it was all Bitcoin. Now it has definitely changed. So the next part, regulated versus offshore markets. And this is all about institutions. Institutions are here, institutions are here. Institutions are here. And we've got a huge, massive I mean, we've got everything from Fidelity Digital Assets, 8 trillion assets under management. We've got Ameritrade with 1 trillion. We've got Van Eck, who are big, huge gold bugs. And they just put this out uh, just about a year ago, which talks about how great uh, Bitcoin is compared to gold. If you've got uh, Grayscale buying up everything, you got the Paul Tudor Jones that says, hey, I'm taking 2% of my total investments, putting in a Bitcoin futures. And that's what he talks about publicly. And you got another legend, uh, billionaire hedge fund, Druck in Miller. Uh, on top of, uh, this has just came out, uh, BlackRock, the CIO says, hey, cryptocurrency is here to stay. And if BlackRock's getting into it, well, guess how much they have? Eight trillion assets under management. On top of PayPal, which they just came in and they're, they're driving the whole market. On top of all these different publicly traded companies like MicroStrategy and Galaxy Digital, who look are looking like geniuses, especially Michael Saylor, because he went from 425 just two or three months ago, and it's valued at 700 million because they bought so much Bitcoin. So look, 
there is so much institutional players in here that you cannot deny that this is a very different market than what it was in 2017. However, the more things change, the more they stay the same. So open interest on the CME hit 1 billion this week, which is an all time high. Look at this chart. This is crazy. You go from just a little bit over here uh, before September, now we're 12 October, nothing really, 9 November. Now look at this, amazing how greedy people get. <laughs> yeah. So really just to sum this whole piece up is that institutional participation is growing with the rest of the market. And you know, we always talk about how institutions, you know, they're really great and they, uh, you know, they have all these tricks and they're really strong hands. Well, not really. I mean, look, this was the Bitcoin futures open interest. And remember in March when everything went down to the ground? Well, it's the same thing here. Uh, they just said, you know what? We're out of here. And we're in March when everything dropped in Black Thursday. They dropped too. And then off they go. And then there was a piece that we just talked about. There was a there was a banking CEO that had invested $200 million into Bitcoin. And he was just like, this was too distracting. And then he had weak hands and he sold it all off. And he lost like, first of all, he bought $200 million. And then if, as far as gains goes, uh, he, as, as of right now, now he's down 130 million. What do you think is going to happen in 2021? So when we talk about like weekends, it's not just the regular retail people. It's also the people that have been in the game as well. So I feel like cryptocurrency is a proving ground to test your ability to hold on to assets because there is such wild swings. In traditional market, if it goes down 2%, 3%, you're like, that sucks. And it kind of hurts. But you know what really hurts? losing 80% and then still holding on. That takes balls and ice in the veins. So all right, I'll get out of here. And then the last piece here, North America versus East Asia investors. And this was always something that I, I uh, had heard about how East Asia was really gobbling up a lot of crypto and digital assets back in 2017 and even, even before so, even 2018. But there's been an inversion now. If you can take a look at this, this is the net inflow to Eastern Asia. Uh, this is this gold piece here. And it really was pretty high back in the day. And then we had net inflow to North America, which was this orange piece. And it kind of was about the same right here. And then it just kind of took off for uh, Eastern Asia and really jumped up around uh, late 2018, early 2019. And then we just had a big inversion right again, right after January 2019. We just had this inversion, just like the uh, traders and investors. Uh, looks like the orange piece here to North America is all the way at an all time high. And then down here for Eastern Asia, all time low. And uh, it's just an interesting piece that again, uh, this is definitely a different uh, bull run. So moving down, the conclusion of the takeaway is this. It is different, but you have to make sure that you understand that these things, they're not gonna go to the moon. We're gonna have peaks and valleys, dips and flows, and we have to make sure that we have our discipline in place. Whatever that discipline is, whatever plan it is that you have in place. I personally have a plan of discipline, gives me freedom, just like Jocko talks about. And I do that because I don't wanna fall victim in 2017. It's worked for me so far. I wanna make sure that I don't just FOMO into projects and dump a lot of different uh, funds into it because I know there's going to be uh, a pullback. There's gonna be retracements. It's gonna be massive. It could be small, it could be big, I don't know. But I wanna have that money uh, back in my account in case it is needed. And that's the big thing. So that's it for that. Let me know what you think in the comment section and let's move on to our next piece.